After 25 years in the fashion industry, I've realized that fashion is not really about the clothes, it's about the people. I'm Laura Van Root Poole, and this is What We Wore. Virginia Johnson is a dynamic person. She's a writer, artist, clothing designer, and textile designer. There's so much inspiration to be drawn from her journey and her openness around both the highs and lows of creative life and career. Virginia Johnson, uh, I am so happy to have you here, and I can't wait to have you here in person soon. Are you in Toronto? I'm in Toronto, in my living room right now. Looking forward to coming down there in a very soon, a few weeks' time. It looks kind of cold there. The light looks a little cold. <laughs> it looks like a snowy light. You can see over here that we don't, we have like our first little bit of green. <laughs> it's been very, very cold, and I feel like we're where we normally would be in, I don't know, beginning of April. Did you grow up in um, Toronto? I know you're Canadian. I, I grew up here and, you know, spent my childhood here, left for like seven years in my 20s and came back again. What's it like to grow up in Canada? Other than everybody's really nice. <laughs> Everyone's really nice and really polite. I had a great childhood here. It's a really nice place to live. It's a nice place to grow up. It's a nice place to raise a family. It was a nice place to be a kid. It's very neighborly, but it's still a big city. You have a beautiful family house at the lake a couple hours away. Yes, it's about actually 45 minutes away and it's no longer in the family. Sadly, when my grandparents died, the house was sold and then it was sort of overhauled and uh, looks kind of nothing like it did before, but it was a very special place. When I heard that you were writing a gardening book, that was my first thought because I think that the the photos I've seen or the images that I've seen of it, seem they seem very beautiful and bucolic and like these gar beautiful wild gardens. Am I right? It was very beautiful. My my grandfather, who was British, he loved gardening. And I think my, my grandmother, just from growing up in the South, she grew up in Richmond. She wasn't a gardener, but she just also had an appreciation for sort of big family homes and gatherings. And so it was right on the lake. She thought it was, you know, both of them thought it was sort of the most magical place ever. And it was sort of a compromise because he was British and she was American. And they just both decided to move to Canada and sort of start a new life in Canada and raise their five kids. And how did they meet? They met on a blind date in New York during the war. He was on leave, I think, for 10 days. And uh, there was some there's some funny story about um, she was living there for in her 20s, you know, with two other women, a working girl. She she was writing copy for for some big retailer, like some big department store. Oh, wow. Like she was she had a way with words. She was really good at she was really witty. There are many stories of her sort of writing ads to sell really unattractive things like rakes or things like that. And <laughs> friends who went, you know, got taken in by the ads and went and um, bought whatever it was she was doing. <laughs> and so they were set up one night and spent 10 amazing days together. And um, there was some story about them being at the Waldorf Astoria and having drinks and and him saying, you know, if you give me another, I forget if it was a cosmopolitan or whatever, he said, I might ask you to marry me. And she said, we'll have another. And so <laughs> I don't know if that was their official engagement, but then he went back overseas and then she joined the Red Cross and was stationed in, she was entertainment director for, um, I want to say a naval base. It wasn't a naval base, like an army base for, for American soldiers in England. Huh. They got married after the war ended. And then how did Canada happen? I don't, you know, I don't know. I think they were trying to figure out where to live. And um, I think that they, my mother was born in Richmond. So I think they went there for a little bit of time. And then they went to the Far East. They went to Hong Kong. He worked, he had a, after the war ended, he worked in insurance and moved to Hong Kong. And then the other children were born, I think one or two of them in Hong Kong. And then they somehow settled on Canada. They thought it was the most beautiful property they had ever seen right on the lake. It was somebody's house who lived in Toronto, a family that would come up at that time. It was, it's a 45 minute drive, 45 minutes or an hour. But at that time it would have taken, I don't know, hours and they would move out the summer. And I remember it being very cold because my grandfather would never, you know, turn on the heat. And like I think <laughs> when they first got it, it was uninsulated and he was very much, you know, British believed in just sort of, you know, yeah. bring. it was magical for sure as a kid. And was your grandmother a gardener? She really wasn't. Um, she loved playing tennis and loved swimming in the pool, and she was very social. We always had tons of people over, and 
Um, but he would sort of, he woke up at six and woke us up all at six and, you know, we had to do chores <laughs> all the time. And, you know, it was always a workplace and she would protect us. She would sort of allow us to, you know, sneak into the TV room and catch a couple of hours and <laughs> lie that she didn't know where we were or whatever. But um, she was, a, she was a lot of fun. He was much more stern and made us work, thought children should work. Was she fashionable? Is that how you got into fashion or how you started to, was that your first memory of fashion? I think the fashion part really came from my mom, but she was very, um, she loved, like she, uh, so I wouldn't say, was she fashionable? She loved clothes and she had a great spirit about clothes, but she was, she also loved kitsch a lot. So she would have, you know, wraparound skirts with, you know, frogs on them or strawberries or like she was very hold on that's not kitsch that's just southern I don't know what you're talking about kitsch (laughs) I don't know she had every single kind of frog you know salt and pepper (laughs) for example like she would not just have one but she'd have lots so is that a southern thing maybe I I kind of think it is too I'm like I'm like what's so kitsch about that I don't know what you're saying (laughs) (laughs) she just had a lot of sense uh, like a sense of fun and maybe it is a southern thing I mean maybe yeah I think so it's not so serious they love to tell a great story and they love, I don't know. Yeah. They're, it, it's a different group of people, I think. <laughs> yes. And she would spend her summers in a bathing suit. I mean, she really was all the time. Like, I mean, in the kitchen and, you know, she'd have a little skirted bathing suit on, which I think I, you know, I already wear a skate. I, I may, used to make skirted <laughs> bathing suits because I couldn't find them. But, uh, and she loved big prints, I would say that. Uh, so it wasn't, you know, loud prints that I really, I think were really eye-catching for me or big polka dot hats or, you know. I think that the maybe the textile part of it really influenced me. Yeah, interesting. Mm-hmm. Whereas my mother's style was more sophisticated and more elegant, maybe. How do you think you started to get into fashion? How did that start? It probably was a lot. My mother, when I was growing up, just, you know, witnessing her kind of, I don't know, or going shopping with her or whatever. She would take me to art classes with her. She loved painting and drawing. And then I started drawing uh, clothes for my TV, whatever TV char- whatever TV show I was watching, I would draw clothes for the paint, clothes for the characters, and my oh, mom gave me beautiful, you know, marker sets and paints and things like that. So I was always watching TV and doing that at the same time and thinking, you know, that was the best thing ever. And I just didn't really <laughs> know what part of it I wanted to go into. You know, was it? I loved magazines. I remember asking my dad for, could I, when I was thirteen, could I please have a subscription to Seventeen magazine? And, <laughs> and I was like. I, I remember that was a really big deal. Oh, yeah. I loved the world of magazines. And I just didn't know which, if I wanted to work for one or did I want to design clothes or, you know, I wasn't really sure. How did it settle out? How did you, what did you study in school and and how did fashion happen for you? I started out, I took a couple of courses as a teenager, but I, I went to university. I went to a university in Canada called Queen's University and I studied art history. I was really drawn to painters and paintings, and I think that gave me a visual vocabulary. I didn't really know what I was going to do with it. I think that gave me an appreciation for history through the arts. And then when I was finished that, I I took a year off and uh, interned at a magazine here. And then I went down to Parsons in New York. That was sort of my dream and did a year and a half there doing clothing construction, sewing, draping, pattern making, and then started working in the in the industry uh, in New York. And was it natural from the beginning? I mean, did it feel like what you sh- should have been doing all along? Absolutely. Uh, I, I absolutely loved being at Parsons, and uh, I love learning how clothes were made. I'm not a great technician when it comes to <laughs> draping or pattern making or sewing. <laughs> I like sewing the first seams of a garment and I'm just not patient enough. I I love drawing the clothes and conceiving of the clothes. And it really wasn't until my late 20s that I even knew that textile design was a thing where I could kind of combine my drawings with my love of shape and proportion. That's when it all came together for me. It was not till a few years later after I had worked a bit in the industry. And along the way, were you still painting or drawing um, on the side? Or, I mean, was that still part of your kind of language, daily language? I would say I I was, but it, it. I think as soon as I started working, I didn't have time to do that so much. So I, I had a couple of um, different jobs in the industry as design assistants. That's where I realized what I really loved. And so I didn't really have time to do the creative. I, I don't think I had a lot of creative time until I was 
in my late twenties and decided to start my own business. One of the things in reading your bio too, that I was really surprised about was that you worked in PR at Helmut Lang. Yes. <laughs> and one, the Hel- Helmut Lang part, I felt really like, wow, I can't, I <laughs> blast from the past, but also the PR part felt very unlike you. <laughs> I mean, not only because, uh, yeah, no offense to the people in fashion PR that listen, but it's, it's a, it's a really tough part of the industry. It is. And I do have a, a, a few really good friends in PR and they're wonderful people, but they're the, I feel like they are the exception. <laughs> exactly. the For me, it was a way in because Helmut had just moved his business to New York from, uh, from Germany. And so there were, I don't know that he came over with, I think there were three or four people. And so they were hiring another five or six people. There was an opportunity in PR. That was sort of a dream thing for me. Um, And I had always actually been interested in PR. I mean, I had worked, I just, I thought maybe PR is me. I have no idea, right? It's part of figuring all that out. And so I had worked for magazines and thought, you know, maybe it's magazines or maybe it's PR because maybe it is, I don't know, meeting the people that work at the magazines. It would be really cool. And Um, But it definitely does attract a certain type of person. And I didn't realize that then. It was very (laughs) not the friendliest part of the business to be in. (laughs) It was not very Canadian, was it? It really, it really wasn't. (laughs) You know, it was, it was amazing to be working there, but it wasn't my favorite department to be in. I think it attracts a lot of the people that love the socializing and the, you know, the scene, right? And that wasn't so much me. And so I asked to be transferred to design uh, they had just signed a deal with Prada at the time where they bought, a, I think, 51% stake in the company. And so immediately there was a, an opening for a position uh, in bags and shoes and accessories with using Prada's factories. My first day up there, it felt immediately like I had found my my tribe and my sort of exact thing to do where it was more about the work and sort of the the making of the things. And tell me about Helmet. I mean, what an amazing time to be working there and with him. I was so lucky to to work there at that time. He he was such a kind person and such a a warm person and and very um more like an artist. I mean, he is an artist now, but I that was very clear back then just how thoughtful he was about everything and intellectual. It wasn't just a superficial thing for him. It was uh something much more and I think everybody understood that. It was it was a magical time to work there. I mean, he he completely changed the industry. I mean, he completely he changed fashion. He did. Had you started your store at that point? I'm trying to think because we're just the about age. then. I think. Yeah. Thinking of you and your and your drawings also feel pretty far away from that that part of fashion as well. So how did you transition from that to, to back to illustration? Wherever I was, I felt like, oh my god, this is so me. Like you know, the minimal. <laughs> lines, whatever, because it, it looked beautiful and we had to wear it all. And it felt, I don't know, so you became it. Uh, and then you realize then I started doing um, work for Kate and Andy Spade. And when I went for an interview there, so I had left Helmet and decided I wanted to do something different or something on my own. Uh, the hours were really, really long. We were often working till, you know, midnight to fax the factories in Italy before they started work <laughs> and all that. And so I decided I wanted to do something different, but I didn't know what it was. And I I had contacted, I think Kate Spade was hiring for an accessories designer. So I met Andy Spade, but also then that was so different with sort of, you know, bright red colors and peonies <laughs> in every, on every desk and very upbeat. And so it felt very um, like its own thing. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is so me. It's so colorful. <laughs> so I started doing some work with them doing illustration work. You hadn't been doing that in so long. How did they even know that you did that? And how did you know that you even did that? After I left Helmet, I had to figure out how I was going to pay the rent and it made me be really resourceful. So I, I did an illustration, I made postcards and um, to, went to a printer and printed out 75 postcards to mail to magazines and stores that I loved to see if they could hire me as an illustrator. So I was kind of just reaching through my pockets and trying to figure out what do I have <laughs> that I can do that, <laughs> that would get me out of a, you know, going to some minimum wage job or whatever. At the same time, I got a job where, as a temp at the American Stock Exchange for one summer. Um, <laughs> I was like putting on a secretary outfit. I borrowed a suit from my friend in high heels and I went down every day. And, and, and that was actually really fun. But I was just trying to figure out how do I make it work and how can I do something that doesn't get me stuck in this situation. And so I sent out the postcards. I, I actually got a couple of jobs um, from that. And I think at the same time, the the 
the job posting from Kate Spade came across. And so I went for an interview for an accessories designer because that's what I had on my resume from Helmut Lang. And I just brought along my illustration portfolio. He really, that's what, I didn't really want another job. And, but he also re responded really well to the, like he loved the illustrations. So that was a huge sort of validation. And then that led into doing the calendars, the stationery, that, that kind of stuff. I didn't know I wanted to start a fashion business yet, but that kind of gave that a big push forward. And were you confident that you knew your hand, that you you knew how you were going to paint? I mean, did you was that did you always feel completely confident in that? Uh, definitely not. I <laughs> back at Parsons, I remember we had to take some illustration classes, and they would bring a model in, and they would teach you how to teach how to do the fashion model proportion, which is different than it's like several heads higher than you know a, a normal person's proportions. And I remember the illustration teacher telling me, you know, your hand is too, your style is too loose. Like no one will hire you because you've got to do a polished figure and it has to look more. He was more, so he was more glam in his style and more kind of stylized. And it was very different than mine, which looked kind of half finished. And so I would say that probably put a dent in my confidence of saying, okay, well, I have a long way to go and, you know, I can't get work like this. And so I think just kind of, I don't know, a lot of times you put yourself out there and you really don't know, you really don't know how it's um, going to be received until it's out there. Like it would be nice to think you could just get confidence on your own, but you do kind of need that validation from people that are like whose opinions you value. Did they send you back a lot and say like, this is not what we're thinking or? No, it was very validating. And it was mostly Andy Spade and Julia Leach, who I dealt with more than Kate. Uh, and they were both embracing of the style from the beginning. There was no kind of adjusting of style. Like it might be, oh, we need to include this part of, you know, the scene or whatever else, but it was about the style. So that was hugely confidence building for me. And from there, how long were you there and, and what happened next? So maybe that was a year or two of doing things for them while I was still in New York. At the same time, I was 29 and trying to decide, you know, where do I want to live? Do I want to live in New York forever? It seemed like that was sort of the fork in the road for a lot of my friends. Uh, so I decided I really want to move back home. Uh, I'm close with my parents and I, you know, I knew that um, it was a good place to live. And around that time, I was trying to decide whether to start my own business and I moved back home with my mom for a year, which was amazing because it's just that kind of, I don't know, a little like little nest where I could, you know, I wasn't having to worry about paying the rent or anything like that. And she was helping me look through the phone book for pattern makers and sewers. And so that was all going on at the same time where I was having, you know, an income from my illustration work and then figuring out what this collection would look like and then how do I sell it and you know going back down to New York with some samples in my bag and my first big moment was going to TG170. I don't know if you remember that store. I do. Yeah, I do. And she was really supportive of of young designers but um but just realizing that cold calling wasn't going to get me anywhere and I just had to go and just say, you know, here I have some samples and and she gave me my first order. I mean, that was the, the best moment of my life. Tell me why it was the best moment of your life. I think it was a lifelong dream. And it was the very first time that she wasn't doing me a favor. She really liked it. And she thought it would be good for her customers. And I could have had this very winding route in my 20s, uh, which where I sometimes didn't know where I was going. But here finally was my dream. What did the first collection look like? I had about eight pieces and printed on a white background and they were maybe two or three prints that were very simple and bright. And that first, I, I then went and did a trade show in New York and my first collection, I remember when I was hanging everything up, just how embarrassing it was because everybody else had very <laughs> muted color palette, grays and black and very sophisticated clothes. And I just felt like mine looked like something out of a circus. And what was I doing? It was just so embarrassing. So you just really don't know, like, it's important to remember that these things, sometimes when you're taking a step forward, it sometimes feels very, uh, very exposed and very embarrassing. <laughs> and then you get that validation from, you know, a great store coming along and, and placing an order. And then eventually I had um, a nice sort of full circle that then Kate Spade carried the line in her shops, which was because I thought, it, you know, it was sort of weird trying out all these things. I'm there, I'm doing illustrations for them. Uh, you know, I'm at the same time starting this business and is that weird for them or whatever. It was just, it was, it was very nice. It was a very compatible 
aesthetic. And how long did this iteration of the business uh, last? Years. And the area where I live, which is called Trinity Bellwoods or Little Portugal, is um, it's definitely become a lot more gentrified. But 15 years ago, it was, you know, not a fancy area. And the strip near me on Ossington was, um, you know, had only two daytime businesses, two two stores. So I rented an, uh, a storefront that was our office. And then at some point, I just decided to open up uh, on Saturdays because people kept knocking on the door because we had our, you know, clothes in the window and whatever. And so I, I, that's what we did. We would just open on Saturdays and then that grew into, okay, I'll move to this place next door and we have upstairs and we have our office upstairs and we can be open all the time. And so it just kept growing like that. Isn't it amazing to think now about how business had to be built back then with no internet? And, and before social media, I mean, it's very, you know, like people could only really find out about you if you had a store. Right. Exactly. And yeah, sure. and if you had to be in Little Portugal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? I know, it's bizarre. Really amazing. You had a lot of success with this and so much success, I think, that you were approached by Target to do a collaboration. Mm-hmm. Tell yes. me about this. This is an interesting chapter. Target had just opened in Canada. They were looking for designer collaborations like they do in the States. We decided to start working with them on a collection of caftans and swimsuits and um, also a little gardening line with, you know, rubber boots and things like that. So that we worked on for two years, almost two years. And um, two weeks before it was supposed to launch, they announced that they were, were insolvent or they filed for creditor protection. So everything was produced. And unlike in the States where the target team produces it, in Canada, they didn't have a team to to manufacture it. So we manufactured it. So they give us a purchase order. We decide very carefully on, you know, everything that they're going to order. We had many, many, many meetings with them. You know, what's going to be on this table? What's going to be on that table? It's all figured out sort of 18 months in advance. And so we sourced like 15 different vendors that we were working with. So Virginia, you had paid for everything. You had received everything. I mean, was all the, all the inventory was with you. You had, you had it all. And then they said, sorry, we can't take it. Yes. We're not taking it. We're not taking any from anybody, even though you have a legally binding purchase order, you know, none of that matters if they have creditor protection. So then you, if you haven't shipped yet to them, your, your main um, objective is to try and sell it at the best price you can to whomever you can find. And then whatever's left over, you can file a claim with whatever, you know, pennies are left over after they close everything. And so what did you do? It was a massive, massive shock. I think we were all in shock, but we worked immediately really hard to just try and, you know, reach out to Target US. Would you take it? This has been created for, you know, using Target's sizing specs and it has Target tag on it. And, you know, and uh, they took a few days to get back to us and then they said, no, they weren't going to take it. And so we, they were the most terrifying four months of my life because, you know, I was just trying to figure out, I don't have any contacts in, um, in mass market. I mean, I can't call up Walmart. I can't, call up. you know, I don't have any contacts. This was a completely new experience for us. So it was a lot of um, just trying everywhere we could, trying, I don't know, QVC, trying um, Dress Barn, trying like any, anybody, any suggestion anybody gave me, I would try and figure out who to sell to because it quickly became apparent. It was only going to be a discounter that would, a discounter that would take it because it was 80,000 products. <laughs> Finally, after four months, we got TJ Maxx. They took the clothing at a discount and we sold the garden stuff to um, a retailer in Canada. And we sold a bit of it ourselves online because we loved it so much. Like it was such a great, such a great cap collection. And I just, I was so excited to finally have my clothing available at affordable prices for people because yeah. it was you know, it's the it's the print that really differentiates it. I always do simple shapes. And so I was really excited about that. So we managed to do, we managed to sell that online, the rest of the remainder ourselves and put in a claim with Target for whatever was left over. Um, but once, so once financially we were out of jeopardy, I really had to do some hard thinking about what I wanted. And I really decided that was it for me. I just, I just didn't want to be doing this business anymore. And so that was, a big decision, but it seemed to me a really, really obvious one. It became more and more clear. And so it was about, you know, talking to the staff about it. Um, I was really worried about how they would um, take it. And everybody was 
amazing and supportive and we didn't have to rush to close down. So we got to have a really nice wind down and everybody was able to find other jobs. And I booked my first three week vacation with my family that August and decided to have a different kind of life for a while at least. How did you have the wherewithal to know that you even could do something next? How did you not know that this was the end of the world kind of thing, which I think we all sort of feel like when things like that happen? For a few months, it did feel like the end of the world. And um, I still had to go five days later to do a photo shoot in LA with the bathing suits because I thought <laughs> it, was already, it was already planned and Target wasn't going to do any of that um, kind of lifestyle photography. And I remember going, we had sent three different shipments because it's so hard sometimes for shipments to cross the border. We had sent three different shipments ahead of time to LA and, um, and you know, to make it on time for the photo shoot. And I thought I need to go because now we need photos to sell this stuff, right? <laughs> like now we need actually a package to sell, to, to send to retailers so we could sell it. But I was so fragile. None of the shipments made it because, you know, how California is very strict, like the plastic <laughs> yes. thing that uh, anything cancer causing, you know, it oh has to God. be. So the sunglasses that were in the shipment, not allowing the shipments to get through. So at the end, I had to hand carry on my person. In Canada, you clear U.S. customs before you go fly into the States. They stopped me and said, why are you carrying these things? I had admitted. I said, I'm carrying commercial samples. I wasn't trying to hide anything. They said, well, you, you're not allowed to do that. And do you know you could be subject to, you know, however many thousands of dollars of fines? Like he was really not being nice. And I just started to cry because I was so fragile. And he was, he said, I can't, you can't do this. I'm going to like fine you $10,000. And I said, I, I, <laughs> like I said, you know, I have to do this thing. Target just closed and these samples I have to sell, you know, have to sell, sell all this merchandise. And he said, you know, you're not going to change my mind by crying. And I said, <laughs> like, do you think if I could help this? I would like, I would uh, still cry. Like, I can't help it. For 45 minutes, I cried, like just quietly and standing at his desk. And he didn't offer me, you know, one Kleenex, nothing. I mean, it was so traumatizing, but I realized I was so fragile in those few days, even though I just also was like incredibly, I had a huge adrenaline to fix this problem. But so I think I just wanted, I think it just became really clear to me that I wanted lightness and I wanted all the business stuff to go away. And I, like my work is so personal to me. It's such, like a very personal expression of me. And so for that to happen and have the callousness of, you know, Target where they, you know, didn't care, it just felt so like it killed my love of designing. It really did. And I didn't know if that would come back. But all I knew is that I really, really wanted to, I was really, you know, burnt out. We had done, it was sort of incredible that we had pulled it off with our tiny team of four to work with Target for two years. It's very, it was very demanding. And I was really proud of what we had done. And I thought, you know, and I had two little, like my kids were three and five at the time. And I just thought, you know, I want something real. This all seemed like just BS to me. And I just want something physical and real. I want to paint. I want to ride my bike. I want to garden. I want to, I want something real. I don't want all this made up stuff and meetings with Target and me having to, you know, straighten my hair and wear like gray suits to the, like, I don't know. I wasn't really wearing gray suits, but just kind of that feeling like, you know, having to deal with you know, big corporations. And, and I felt I was putting on a facade and I just wanted it all gone. I just wanted to get back to something that, you know, was real and to find out what that was. And I had really wanted to do a book. I had all these ideas of more artistic things. And so I enrolled in some art classes that I loved. Different mediums and what you were, you were used to. Yes. I, I wanted to learn how to paint portraits. Oh, wow. And use acrylic paints properly. I just hadn't really, I, I'm always scared of faces because I don't, know how to do them properly. And so I enrolled in some class in portrait classes. And what a weird shift it was from going to, you know, working a gazillion hours a week to just kind of, wow, okay, we're just sitting in this class for three hours painting a model. Were your paintings tempura or or watercolor or were they they were acrylic before? Always watercolor and always just kind of hot watercolor. Like I just I hadn't really taken that many art classes. Um and so it's just sort of my a more sort of decorative style and something. I just figured out how to make watercolor work for me. I couldn't actually paint right now, a, like a, a, a an accurate scene of a like you know. I'm I'm I, I'm not a trained watercolorist. This is the art nerd in me. Do you think a little bit of the watercolor um, worked for you because it was so mobile that because you could carry it and take it anywhere and it was not a pain for sure. And I don't like 
set up. Like I'm really impatient with setting up uh, like a work desk or something. So totally. And a canvas and all that. Yeah. So I just, I have my desk in the studio. I have all my watercolors on a shelf behind me and I, I literally just can twist my body like this and pull it like this. And all the only work I have to do is going to the tap to get a thing of water and that's it. Right. It's like ready to go. And so were the portraits good, Virginia? Were they? I did like them. I love portraiture. And I realize that it's not something you're better at overnight. I realize this is sort of a, a lifelong thing that you can revisit and get better at. And, and, and I realized I don't want to be, I thought maybe I just wanted to be a painter when I closed the business. I thought I, business is awful. I hate business. Why did I ever like business? Why did I ever like passion? Um, it's not for me. It's such a fluke. Why did I end up in, like, I really, really for several years thought that was just a complete aberration and, and it was the wrong light, the wrong path. Did you have therapy in this time or did you just figure it out on your own? That's a good question. Did I? I might have for a little bit, but I, you know what? I, I don't think I did, at least not that first year. I had a business coach up and like through the whole Target thing, meaning not just when it all fell apart. I think I got a business coach actually when I first got pregnant. So that was five years earlier. Just how do I structure the business? Uh, how When I'm gone for, I wanted to be gone for a few months. How do I, I need to hire somebody. So she really helped me. And then trying to decide what to do about the business after the Target thing. Should I close down? Should I not? And she would sort of walk me through all the steps. What are the pros and cons? You know, are you walking away from something important? And, you know, what is it going to feel like, you know, to walk away from all that and, and all those things that were very helpful. How lucky. It was very lucky. So, so I didn't have therapy so much as just, but it felt weird. I mean, it felt very weird to make that transition at age 42 to go from working like crazy to, you know, like, oh, wow, okay, I can pick my kids up from school and I can, you know, it it was wonderful to have all that time. Like I, I did do a book, as you know, in 2018, and then I, I'm just doing another one now. It felt wonderful to have all that time, but it was disorienting. Do you think that your children remember sort of you at that time and a change in you? And, and I guess the other question is, was it that first trip that you went on that first three week trip with your family? I mean, could you see the light? Like, could you see that, that this could change? That was the happiest. I mean, I, I look back to that August and it was one of the happiest times of my life because I never could take three weeks before that the kids might be too young to remember what that was like before but i mean i i never picked them up i never was that mom who made connect like i didn't have any connections with the other mothers and all that. <laughs> i understand <laughs> yes i'm sure um that changed and that was very enriching i mean that was i would say the female friendships have been one of the the biggest kind of uh, something i didn't expect but i had so, i had time to kind of nurture those my kids are now 10 and 12. And so now I'm, I, I feel that I have, I have a, a much better work-life balance than I did. And I started building up the business again because it suddenly weirdly came back a couple of years ago that I thought, you know what, I, I really love this. I really want to do this again. And it wasn't just a fluke. And this is what I'm, I'm meant to do. I really, I feel it in my bones that I love to do it. Will you tell me a little bit about that and sort of what you're doing and, and how it came to be? I started doing um, some shawls and tunics again two or three years ago. But what really excited me was um, in December 2019, I went with a friend of mine to um, to Jaipur to look at block printers. And I had always done uh, screen printing, mostly for my line, where I would do the watercolor illustrations, but scan them in and flatten them. Block printing was, was a whole new sort of thing for me. And I think I just fell in love with that process of how physical it was and how tactile it was that you still have artisans, you know, they've been doing this for hundreds of years, carving actual blocks. So I send my artwork and they, I love that it has another interpretation of another person's hand in there too, because it's not exactly, exactly the same as what my drawing is. And they carve them and they, you know, I tell them the colors and the layout and everything. And um, so I think that was so exciting to me. It felt like something new. And I also just had a weirdly, was weirdly super clear about who my customer was. And I think that I had lost that before, that I had been 29 when I started the business. And by the time I was 42, everyone working with me was 32 or around there or younger. And I remember them asking me for direction because we were trying to figure out what, you know, new stores to be in or whatever. And, and it was confusing 
you know, am I designing for a 20 something or a 40 something? Like has the customer grown with me or not? And so I, I kind of was losing my way a bit trying to figure that out. So once I started a year or so ago, um, kind of working with this new block printer, it seemed completely clear to me that my customer is my age and it has grown <laughs> up with me. And I have customers who are several decades older. And I do have some customers who are younger, but just to focus on what I know looks great on a woman and what I know what her needs are. And I know her lifestyle that is so right to me. And, and that's been, I think I had really lost that before and that I just love doing caftans and tunics and sort of summary, even though I live in Canada, I just live in some kind of a dream world, <laughs> but that felt very clear. And it's been wonderful the last year because I have a studio now um, in the back garden. We're able to have customers come and try things on and I'm meeting all of them and having conversations and having, you know, little events in the backyard. And, and that's been um, really amazing. And amazing to have so much control over it and being able to handle it yourself with e-com and, and social media, I would imagine, is completely different. I also love, I love the Jaipur connection. I love, I think anybody who's sort of lost their way or lost their love of of art or creativity, I think Jaipur is really the sort of the key, right? I mean, just yeah. to the, these artisans and to, to collaborate with these people that have been doing it for thousands, you know, generations and generations is really, really special. Yeah. It is very special. Will you tell me a little bit about the book? I'm a good bit behind you on it, but I'm I'm building a garden too. Mine's not happening as fast as yours is or did. But did you did you always garden? No, God no. I I didn't. <laughs> I think I I just was too busy. You know, when I was younger, I just think I worked a lot, and I just you know was always just throwing myself into whether it was illustrating work, like not drudgery, but I just mean I just think. My first house I bought in this neighborhood when I was 29 or 30, and it was very, very wild and unkempt. I didn't do one thing and it just felt overwhelming and like, who needs it? Who needs a garden? And and also maybe because when you're younger, you're just going out more. You're not so much, it's, it's part of the, you know, nesting thing probably. I don't know. My husband and I, I think we kept on opening businesses and we kept, I mean, I don't know that I ever even looked out the window. Like my inside of my house is amazing, but I don't think I had time to even look out. And I had a neighbor come and introduce himself this weekend. And I said, God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> we've been here 20 years and this is the first time we've ever touched the, the garden. Sorry. It's true, right? You're, you're in building mode and it's when you're yeah. building businesses, it's not, you don't have, to, you're not putting your feet up and kind of hanging out in the backyard. Was it hard to learn or was it, I mean, did you know what to do? Was it innate? I can't see myself ever not calling myself an amateur gardener because I, I think even though you learn more and more, it's still nothing compared to what there is to know. But I think that for me, it was really when once we had kids and just starting to realize you're planted, I mean, planted in, you know, in the summer months anyway, um, in the backyard. And our so our first, it was really just a long, narrow lot, a construction site, basically, that we wanted fences there were no fences between ours and the neighbors and then just, you know, lawn and a sand pit. And, and that was it. And I, I think I planted trees along one side and that those, you know, eventually gave us lots of privacy. So I would tinker around. There were a few things I'd spend time like learning about, but so I can only kind of absorb information on one or two new plants a year. I mean, I really just am like, Oh, climbing hydrangea. Okay. Does it grow here or there? Okay. And looking at it online or whatever. And so I think just it grew in stages, but then it it really came together in 2020 because the studio just fortuitously was finished in April 2020. I can't believe the timing of that. It was amazing. And then so the whole yard had been dug up and was nothing. And so I remember my first journey out of lockdown, May 16th, 2020, my first time leaving the family and getting in a car and going to a neighboring it's a city about an hour away to Hamilton. And just that I mean, so I just, that feeling of escape of, you know, <laughs> we weren't even technically maybe allowed to go from city to city. I'm not sure, but I bought a whole bunch of, like, I just sort of my wish list of trees and I bought that day, I don't know, 12 or 14 trees or something. And had <laughs> a friend of ours who's very handy came over and dug holes. And, and I said to the, you know, the lady said, well, you're not going to dig these yourself, are you? Or you're going to get a professional, aren't you? And I said, yes, but really I didn't want to. I was just trying to do it kind of on a shoestring. And so we, I got all the information from her. My friend came over and dug holes. I dug one. I, I like to say we dug the holes. <laughs> I dug one and not even a very deep one. 
and then it, overnight we just had this beautiful like the garden came together overnight and so it's really just I just tinker and try and figure out things but I'm not a die hard you know I, I don't do it like every day or necessarily even every week is the book about creating this garden it is it's about the journey of doing it in stages doing it in stages as your as your situation changes if you're single or you have a family or your kids are out of the house or whatever you need it to do it's that's what I love about it is how flexible it is because you can't really make a mistake you don't need to hire someone to do it for you Virginia, you've done so many different things in your career. Is there anything that you, do you know of something that you've not done yet that you want to do? Do I, I, like, I really, I would love to do more painting. I think I would love to get great at doing portraits, <laughs> even though I said it <laughs> a whole lifetime, but I really would love to, I really would love to do more painting. I, I agree with that for you because I, every time I go to the store in Brentwood, we have several of your paintings on the walls there and they're so special there is a portrait of me yeah it looks way better than I do so I do think you're great at portraits <laughs> oh thank you that's really nice of you to say well and I think it's a different you know I think probably you're more used to people seeing your things on in clothing and in books maybe you know I think seeing them on on the wall is really different Mm-hmm. that's true I always feel bad with my Canadian um, guests because I feel like it's a it's some somehow what <laughs> countryist. Um, I don't remember if Canadians have proms, do they? <laughs> you know what uh, we like, I think we don't call them a prom, but maybe some do. Like, so I just know any of the schools I went to, we didn't call it a, a prom; we called it a formal. Do you know what you wore to your favorite one? I think it was Victor Costa. Do you remember who that nice. was? Nice, yes, love Victor Costa. And I remember it had. <laughs> black. Uh, I wish I was, you know, would wear more colors when I was younger, but I really was into just being sophisticated. I remember I had dangly pearl uh, teardrop earrings. Strapless? Strapless. Velvet or moray? No, it was chiffon. It was like a gathered chiffon. It sort of crossed over. The skirt was kind of like where they would do that drapey. This was like in the Donna Karen era where they would do <laughs> sort of drapey from one side, you know, mini skirt. Yes. Low, like medium sized pumps. Like probably those were very um, 80s. I don't know. Were they? <laughs> Di- died to match. <laughs> maybe even suede, which maybe wasn't so good for whatever month that was. But um, <laughs> that's what I remember wearing to my formal. Thank you, Virginia. Thank you, Laura. What We Wore is produced by Capital and Balto Creative Media. The original song, Someone So Enchanting, was composed and performed by Britt Drazda. queencitypodcastnetwork.com